Energy is probably one of the most important topics in dynamics, in physics, and really one of the most important topics in all of science, if you come right down to it. Uh, energy is important in chemistry, biology, civil engineering, paying your electric bill. Energy is important. So I want to do a straightforward, classic example of a conservation of energy problem to talk you through how you do an energy problem in, in physics and how you think, reason through these things. Uh, here's our scenario. I've got a ramp that's tilted 7 degrees up from horizontal. On that ramp, which is frictionless for the moment, it's a frictionless ramp, I've got a block of mass m equals 0.1 kilograms that I've pulled backward against a spring with spring constant 150 joules per meter squared. Uh, that's the same as newtons per meter or kilograms per second squared. Units for spring constants are messy. But uh, that's our spring constant. And I'm going to pull the mass back by a distance L from the natural length of the spring. That distance L will be 5 centimeters. And I'm going to hold it there at rest. And then my plan is I'm going to let go of that mass. And it's going to go shooting up the ramp. And at some point, since it's going uphill, it's going to slow down and reach some maximum height before it comes back down. I want to know how far up would it go before it stopped. That's my question. And I want to analyze that using conservation of energy. So here's the deal. To talk about energy, to talk about conservation of energy, I'm going to use this general conservation of energy equation. The total initial energy plus work, or I suppose any other transfer of energy from outside the system, will equal the total final energy. That's our plan. To make this work, well, the first step we have to do is say, what system are we considering? Because if we're talking about the total energy of something, it has to be the total energy of our system. So to choose the system, obviously, uh, let, me, let me write that down. Uh, step one is to choose our system. And uh, obviously, the block is going to be part of our system, because that's an important part of the story. The block is the motion we want to keep track of. So the block is important. And we could just leave it at that and analyze everything else as an external force acting on the block. That said, it's going to be a lot easier if we consider potential energy. Potential energy, as I'm sure you've learned, is energy due to interactions between different parts of your system. And for something to be, for those interactions to be energy in your system, the, both parts have to be in the system. So, for example, the block is interacting with the Earth by the gravitational interaction, and so I want to keep track of gravitational potential energy between the block and the Earth. That means that the Earth, the planet Earth, has to be part of my system if I'm going to keep track of that. Similarly, the spring is also an important part of this story, and so the spring should also be part of my system because I want to keep track of its energy rather than treating it as an external force. So I've chosen my system. That's my system. And uh, step two, then, is to say what forms of energy are going to be significant in this problem. Step two, forms of energy. Uh, and so I'm really I'm just breaking down what is E total in this story. What's that going to be? And, well, how do I do that? I guess you can, it's, there's sort of an art to it, figuring out what's going to be relevant in a given problem, figuring out what's important. But uh, when in doubt, it turns out I've got a checklist. Look, it's a checklist. If you want to like, even pause your video, you can see my little forms of energy checklist here. It's a checklist of just things that might be important. So I'm going to go through, just go through my checklist and see what's relevant here. So for example, any object whose speed changes, you want to include a term for its kinetic energy in the story. So uh, we're going to have the, kinetic, the initial kinetic energy of the, of the block, m, uh, to be an important term, one, one form of energy you're going to track. Now technically, we could also track the Earth's kinetic energy, because we know that if the mass is interacting with the gravitational it will pull on the Earth. In practice, kinetic energy, uh, if you have a large object interacting with a much smaller object, big one mass much greater than the other, the much greater mass object, its kinetic energy is basically constant as far as these things are concerned. You can prove it mathematically, but we're going to leave out the kinetic energy of the Earth. Uh, similarly, I'm going to assume that the spring is massless, even though it's moving. We're going to assume a massless spring to keep our lives simple. Okay, got that. So any object whose rotation changes, there's nothing rotating in the story that I've told so far. Uh, any object that has a temperature change, no temperature changes are important here. Remember, it's a frictionless surface, so there's no temperature change going on. Uh, no phase changes, nothing burning fuel. Uh, an object whose height changes, yeah, this mass is going from one height to another. So certainly I need to include a gravitational potential energy term. Uh, my notation for potential energy is going to be capital V. V gravitational initial is my gravitational potential energy term. 
And I've got that. Uh, any spring whose length changes? Yeah, we've got a spring whose length changes in the story. So I want to have a V spring. And here's the initial term uh, in there. Um, charged dog, no charged objects in the story. Um, no given potential energy graph. That's our story for forms of energy. So I've got, these are my three relevant forms of energy for this problem initially. And uh, then I may have work that I have to worry about. And that has to equal same forms of energy, but their final state. Kinetic, gravitational potential, and spring potential energy all over there having, a f having final values as well. Now, the good news is I know a lot of things about each one of these. I, I, know, I know expressions, mathematical expressions, for each one of these forms of energy. So I can write those down. Uh, so, for example, for kinetic energy, uh, we're doing standard classical physics here, so that means one half times the mass times the initial speed squared, one half mv squared is my initial kinetic energy, plus gravitational, uh, we'll say mass of the object times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration times z initial. Z in this equation, if you've worked with this before, uh, z just means uh, height above some reference point. So plus z is defined to be upward for this form of this, uh, where up is defined to be opposite gravity. So uh, sort of circular reasoning there. But we're choosing coordinates so z goes upward. That's something I'll talk about in a second, actually. But I'll write down the four the equations first. Got that? And then for the spring, 1 half k spring times its compression, delta x squared, uh, delta x initial squared, is what I'm is is what that is. Uh, plus work equals, and then these same things for the final case. Where can I write those so they aren't too big? Hmm. Let's see. One half m v final squared plus m g z final plus one half k spring delta x final squared. All right, so I've got my, this is my equation written out in detail for conservation of energy. Now I can look at some of these things and say there are terms I will be able to simplify in this equation, right? I can look at this and say, for example, that uh, my initial speed is zero. That was given in the problem. So V initial is zero. I can say Z initial. Well, I haven't actually defined what my coordinates are for z yet. I've said that plus z has to be up in the form of this. Plus z has to be up away from the ground. But, uh, but that, I haven't said where z equals 0 is. That's actually a, a feature, not a bug. Uh, I get to choose that z equals 0, so I will. I'm going to choose it really simply to say that z equals 0 is my starting height. And, of course, plus z goes upward. So z equals 0 is my starting height. That means that this is 0. I already feel good about this. All right. Um, k spring, let's see. So mass is known, mass is known, g is known, k spring is known. Delta x initial is known. That's my L, right? My initial compression of the spring compared to the natural length is 5 centimeters. So that's a known thing. We'll talk about work in a second. And final, these things I also have to look at. Um, z final, well, let's see. Uh, Things I want to know. Uh, delta x final, the spring, after the, after the block has sprung off into the distance, uh, how, much com how compressed is that spring? Well, hopefully not at all. Hopefully once the block is shot off, the spring will return to its natural length, naturally. So this, delta x final, is going to be zero. The next question is, how far up would it go? What's the key idea of how far up you go? Right? How far up this ramp you go? Well, that key idea is to say, what's my, well, when I get to the highest point, that's my turning point, right? That's just, just when I get as high as I'm going and momentarily come to rest before I slide back down. That's the idea of how far up it will go. So implicit in this is the idea that V final equals zero. If we're going to the place where it stops naturally, then the final speed is zero. So I get to say this is zero as well. That's all handy. And... My only real unknown here is z final, which is very closely related to my real question. My question, of course, in this is what distance d along the slope am I going to go? And so 
uh, if I can find z final, that's going to be related to this distance d in a relatively straightforward way. But uh, we'll put that in in a second. But you can see where this is going. I've got actually a pretty straightforward thing right now. The only piece left to figure out is the work piece. And let me say a word about that. Uh, three, step three here is to ask about external, external forces, forces acting on this from outside the system. What are my external forces here? Well, uh, I know that as the block slides along this ramp, there is a normal force, normal mean perpendicular to the surface, holding it up so the block doesn't fall through the ramp. If, there were, if it weren't there, the block would fall through. There has to be something holding it up. So there is a normal force. I'm going to write that as F sub n, a normal force, from the ramp on the block. And then the other one I can see is the force of the wall on the spring here. There's a, when the spring expands, you know that if that were your nose on this end and it sprung off there, uh, you would feel that spring push it on your nose until it finally relaxed. So there is a force on the wall there, and that's also important. So for, normal force and, I don't know, force wall, something like that. And so I want to know what work do those forces do? Do I need to include them in this problem, in, in, my, in, my, in setting up this problem? Well, the equation for work, I know, work due to force I is given by, uh, and these, uh, well, what do I want to say? Uh, I, I'll actually be one step more careful. I'm going to say the tiny bit of work due to force I over a tiny distance where that force acts is force I dot product with that tiny distance, dri, and uh, that dri is the distance that the contact point moves. The distance where the point of application of the force moves over the course of a tiny bit of time tells me how much work is done in that tiny bit of time. I'm using little d here to, mean in, to be calculus speak, meaning tiny bit of. So tiny bit of work due to force I is given by the force vector dot product with tiny bit of distance where force at the, at the point, the particle, where force I acts. So OK, let's look at this. Uh, for force, for the normal force, for the normal force, I know that the normal force points perpendicular to the slope, and my dr is along the slope, right? dr is along the slope, and those are perpendicular. The normal force and the, and the distance moved are perpendicular automatically, unless the slope is moving. Uh, those are perpendicular. That's supposed to be an n, not some weird thing. Force normal uh, is perpendicular to dr, so d work normal is equal to zero because the dot product of perpendicular vectors is zero. Similarly, for the wall, the wall's force is up the slope. Force of the wall points up the slope, but dr wall equals zero. Because, remember, the point of contact is right here where the spring is touching the wall. That point doesn't move. This, that, that end of the spring is glued to the wall. It doesn't move. So dr wall equals zero. So the little bit of work due to the wall is also zero. And that's true no matter what, how many little pieces you add up. So that tells me that there is, there's no work done by external forces in this problem. I've set it up so that we are an isolated system. Energetically, at least, work equals zero. The total work equals zero. We're an isolated system. That means this whole thing can be left out. This work term can be left out. And that leaves me with a simple equation. Uh, step four is just solve. Solve the equation. What do I have? I have one half k spring. And delta x initial was the length l, remember? l squared. And that's the only term that's not zero on the left, because work is also zero. That has to equal mg z final. And how is z final related to the distance d I'm trying to solve for? Um, let me draw a quick little picture. This is d. This is my angle theta. And z final is this side of that right triangle, right? It's, per, it's vertical. Is the vertical direction perpendicular to horizontal. So that's the final. It sure looks like 
Z final is the opposite side, and D is the hypotenuse. It sure looks like that's equal to, oh, whoops, I forgot my absolute value. That's equal to M times the magnitude of G times D sine of theta. And I feel a little guilty for using D as a distance in the same problem where I've used D as little bit of in calculus speak, but hopefully the context is clear. This is a distance little d. So there we go. And here, my ultimate unknown here is that D over there. So I can solve. I can find that answer. Uh, solving for D, I get that D equals, I'm just going to divide by M magnitude G sine theta over here. I get K spring L squared over m magnitude of g sine of theta. That's what I come up with for this. Um, I left out the 2. 1 half k spring L squared. There's supposed to be a 2 in the denominator. Uh, okay, I've got that. And at this point, it's an answer. I can plug in, I can plug in numbers. Uh, even before I plug in numbers, let me do a quick little double check, because I always like double checking my answers symbolically in physics before I plug in numbers. So, for example, if I pulled the spring back more, if I, if I pulled it back further, would I expect to go farther up the ramp? Yeah, I would. And indeed, if L is bigger, if I pull it back by more than 5 centimeters, I'll get a bigger value for D. That makes sense. Um, if this were a heavier block, if it were much, if instead of 0.1 kilograms, it was 10 kilograms or something, but I had the same spring back here, would I expect it to go as far? No, I wouldn't. I'd expect that spring to not be nearly as effective in pushing it up, pushing it up and I'd expect it not to go as far. And indeed, if m gets bigger, d gets smaller. That makes sense. You can do a lot of checks like this. If, if gravity were stronger, it wouldn't go as high up. If the spring were a tighter spring that stored more energy per unit per, per distance pulled, if k spring were bigger, we'd go farther up. All these things, oh, sine of theta. Uh, if theta goes to zero, so it's flat, so it's more and more flat, um, sine of theta goes to zero, and when we divide by that, it should go to infinity, right? So the distance it would travel will go to infinity. Frictionless ramp, but it's not a ramp, it's flat, it will go infinitely far away. So that makes sense too. I like all of these things. This, that doesn't prove this is right, but they all have the right sorts of behaviors. Uh, so that, I'm, I'm happy about that. So let's try it out. Let's put in our numbers. We've got 150 kilograms per second squared. I'm going into base SI units for this because that's what will be easiest to cancel out. Times 0.050 meters squared, that's my L, divided by 2 times 0 0.10 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the sine of 7 degrees. Uh, that, you can just plug it into a calculator. Uh, when I plug it in, I get about, uh, I'll say approximately, 1.6 meters as my answer. I'll go 1.6 meters up the slope plug in those numbers. Let me make sure it's meters. I, I just said meters, but I didn't check, did I? Let's see. Kilograms cancels with kilograms. Um, oh, do I have something wrong? Oh, no, that's good. That's good. Um, second squared cancels with second squared. Um, and this is a meter squared divided by one power of meters left in the denominator. Yay! Meters is what I get. So it, it is a distance. 1.6 meters is what I come up with. That's fantastic. Um, and Maybe this is a good place to stop this particular little video. I'll do a follow-up with, uh, with, with a related problem, related system, asking uh, what changes if we have a different story. But this gives you a first take on how you can solve a problem with conservation of energy using a bunch of different forms of energy and seeing which ones matter, plugging in your own stuff, evaluating external forces, and finally solving the math to get a final answer. I hope that shows you one piece of why energy is useful in physics. and. Uh, I'll see you in another video.